Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to episode 15 of Retuning Your Firm. It's actually episode 30, which seems a bit amazing to myself and Francesca when we were chatting about it a minute ago. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about a number of things. Firstly, did you enjoy Remo? I hope you had a chance to go and spend some time in Remo. Secondly, what are today's themes? Well, there are three. We've got North Shoring, and that's a term you probably haven't heard before. We've got remote working and how can you actually really take advantage of that? Is this a permanent state? And then lastly, team building. So those are the three themes that we're gonna be picking up as we go through today. Moving on, who's on today's panel? I'd first like to welcome Mark Sykes, who is the head of entrepreneurial business at BDO. Secondly, I would like to welcome Anne Harnity, the managing director and founder of Johnson Beaumont, which is a recruitment consultancy. Thirdly, Jame Danit, Excuse me, Dame Janet Gamer, uh, probably one of the most distinguished lawyers of her generation. Um, and she'll be talking to us, as I said, about uh, working from home and remote working and what that really means in practice. And lastly, our anchor tenant, Francesca Lagerberg, who is the global leader network capability release for Grant Thornton, and yours truly, the founder and chief executive of the Managing Partners Forum. So let's talk quickly about what are, what are we actually talking about here? What are we doing in retuning our firm? Well, there are seven strategies that we've found particularly resonate. First of all, think big. Believe six impossible things before pre breakfast, as Lewis Carroll memory said. Secondly, remember that you are the power of your relationships. And that having a relationship isn't just like having uh, a, an address book. That's not, it's necessary, it's not sufficient. You've actually got to reciprocate. You've got to remember who people are, favors, win-win, if you like. But also think small. Don't just think big, think small. What are the angles that will really resonate with your key audiences? North Shore is quite an interesting one. Let's explore that a little bit later today. Are you thinking of doing a campaign or a one-off? Again, one-offs are great, but actually converting an audience into a community, and that could be a community of clients, is a really valuable approach because it really does resonate much more with the people you're trying to get through to. You have to drop convention. Um, will we go back to working from home? That's, excuse me, to working from the office? Who knows? Will it be a hybrid world? Um, so you've got to go for new ideas, new services. Things aren't the same. Are we in a new normal? Are we in a new future? Do we have a world post-COVID or are we a, in a COVID world forever? Who knows? Speed is of the essence. And that really means in practice lean start. So you've got to think about what you're doing in terms of the assumptions. Any accountant will tell you, change the assumptions, you can change the profits, easy. But we've got to articulate those assumptions. You've got to market test them. And then if they prove invalid, and some will, all experiments fail, we know that in some way or another, then amend them and pivot in a new direction. And that structure is quite helpful because it depersonalizes a lot of conversations on the management board. Finally, <clears throat> be entrepreneurial. Keep listening and innovating. And the key word in that sentence is always going to be listening. If you're not listening to your clients, how can, are you sure your, uh, your services are properly aligned? If you're not listening to your people, are you going to be actually doing the right thing for them? So remember that or being an entrepreneur is fundamentally about listening. And then those seven thoughts, strategies come from Elena Kutzka of Globsec speaking back in March, in April, sorry, at a global th uh, think tank town hall. Very interesting, I think. So let's have a look now. We're moving into the section of the uh, to do with polls. And what are we hearing here? Well, firstly, some feedback from the UK government. Your polls are incredibly valuable in our analysis during these dynamic times. Uh, one day I was late getting them the analysis and they asked where it was. So I think that's a pretty good way of showing that we're being listened to ourselves, which is great. Uh, and it's more than that because our poll was recently included in a House of Lords report on the future EUK EU relationship on professional business services. And I think I'm correct in saying, having looked through the report, ours was the only poll that was included in addition to government statistics. So that was, again, I thought a mark that what we're trying to do here is being noticed elsewhere. And that's important, I think. So let's look back at what happened in last week's poll. And there's a few slides here. There's some more on the um, website, which you can always check out. So we were trying to understand in pricing and say, well, you've got two aspects of pricing. You've got pricing the operational issues and you've got pricing governance, which is a much more high level concept with two philosophies and principles. And to what extent are firms actually moving towards pricing governance? Um, well, I think it's fairly clear who the winner is there. There has been some thought given to it, but nothing concrete yet, which is in our, in our sector where it's saying not a lot, mate, but it's an elegant way of putting it, I guess. So that's one. <clears throat> who owns strategy? Again, there's always an interesting conversation. We had Andrew Kakabadze the other day of who owns culture, which is not dissimilar in many ways. And who owns the cult strategy? Well, 
it's an equ equally between, I guess, the, the board or the divisional leaders and obviously the managing partner and coming into the third. Uh, but again, in this poll, quite a bit, people didn't have a strategy or pricing strategy. Uh, to what extent, again, um, excuse me, I'm going in the wrong direction. So what proportion of partners and associates have undergone at least eight hours or five hours, respectively, of development in pricing skills? About half of them are none. And there aren't very many who have done it a lot, although clearly the partners are getting slightly more training than the next level. That's all you can take away from that. Uh, how much of the firm is based on partner intuition? Mostly based on partner intuition. Only a very few people are actually seeing it as a data-driven activity. And lastly, um, the old issue of engagement and advocacy. Um, if somebody's neutral, if they're asked, I'm not sure that's necessarily a very positive way of thinking about it. Uh, only 30% roughly were speaking highly of their pricing strategy. So again, you can talk, take a view on that as to how helpful that is. So let's move on to today's poll. Um, this one is our monthly tracker, which some of you will have done before. Um, <clears throat> it's the same issues as always, hence a tracker. So business priorities, the barriers to optimal performance, what's being discussed at management meetings, what do you, is your firm's what sort of dip is likely in your firm's income, what's happening with activity levels, headcount, um, general mood towards turning to the office at some point in the future, and what that might mean for future office space requirements. And what's it telling us? Let's have a quick look. Okay, the first question was selecting the top priorities for the firm over the next 12 months. And <clears throat> as in, I think every last few weeks, the increase in the operational efficiency has come in at the top and the ones that are sort of coming up behind it pretty much all with the same roughly level are the issue around people skills and capabilities and developing a clear purpose and strategy so they seem to be the top three priorities coming back from today's poll and that's not dissimilar to last week last month sorry in terms of the dip 10 percent again remains the sort of most likely uh, projected dip involved but a fair per chunk, a quarter, I think now it's up to, are not predicting a dip at all. I remember back in April, we were looking at everybody pretty much saying it was going to be 30% or more. So that's a pretty massive shift, but <clears throat> that's been a gentle shift away in attitudes over that three periods. But thirdly, in terms of expanding or contracting the level of activity over the next year, no change is the, is the, is the, is the major one there. And there is quite a significant group, 30%, who are looking for an expansion. And again, that is not dissimilar to last, <clears throat> last week, where roughly the, the first, those expecting to contract and those willing to expand are about equal, but a big chunk. But one third, one third, one third, roughly, as I said. Uh, in terms of new work, um, that's looking to expand. Um, there's slightly more on that side than there is on the contraction side. And that, again, reflects the same as last month. Um, headcount, and that's obviously going to be particularly important for the recruiter Anne, and for Janice as well around the people agenda. Uh, no change. Um, and the contraction, again, unfortunately, outweighs the expansion. Again, that's been a very typical throughout the last six or seven months that we've been doing this tracker. In terms of the people, people likely to be working from home after the pandemic has eased, and we can all have our discussions as to when that might be, uh, around half, 46%, um, and then uh, <clears throat> pretty much nobody saying, in fact, nobody is saying that everyone's going to be working in the office. That's 0%, um, and about 20% saying that everyone's likely to be working from home. So again, that's not that's pretty com pretty similar to last month, to be honest. In terms of <clears throat> anticipation, again, we have this kind of, these sort of peaks between about, the, I mean, nobody's more, that's zero, about the same, about a third, 20% uh, or less is nudging towards 50%. So there's quite a big chunk of property issues that are gonna be, I think, fighting particularly the property firms quite soon in the construction and the investment managers and all the other people involved in that area. In terms of what are the things that are, what are the constraints? What are the things that are getting in the way? Well, the poor economic outlook is absolutely the top item this week uh, or this month rather. And then the other one, which wasn't even there six months ago, the financial health of the client base comes in number two. Um, and number three, looking at it, is the lack of client instructions. So it, it's very much client driven is the kind of areas which are actually help and making preventing people from achieving their optical performance. Uh, penultimately, what are the three areas that normally carry the most weight during partners? Well, 
this again is fascinating for the people who are involved in the marketing community, which we organize, PM Forum. Last week, last month, finance uh, was just a bit ahead of marketing, I think 10 by 10 points. This week, it's the same. So marketing, for the first time ever, is ahead of client service, equal with finance, ahead of innovation, ahead of operational performance, and ahead of the people agenda. Don't think I've ever seen that in the 30 years I've been doing this game. And lastly, which statements are true about firms? This one's always a little bit interesting to do with behaviors. Um, luckily, only a very modest number of you say that none of those statements are true, which is great. And Andrew Kakabadzi, when he came on the call a month ago, said actually these are pretty good results compared with some of your clients. We definitely their boards get very, very uh, much lower numbers than we get as a sector. So the leadership is something that these are pretty good numbers. They're all into the sort of 50% plus because this, this one was anyone, any of them can be true. So where they've got strategic options, employees valued and valued at least as highly as other stakeholders, that's 60%. Uh, accessible leaders, 70%, transparent, 50%. Those are, I think, are very high numbers. Uh, that's encouraging. And that's probably why, despite people's expectations that the income was going to dip and going bad places, uh, it hasn't actually happened. The firms have come together in a very collegiate way, even if it's all been on Zoom like we are today. So that's probably enough for me in terms of sharing. And I will move to the first of our presenters and welcome Mark Sykes, who's going to talk about North Shoring. There we go. Brilliant. Come off mute there. Richard, uh, thank you very much. That was an absolutely fascinating poll as well, actually, So, uh, which does play slightly into um, this topic. Um, so I, I suppose just think, thinking about that is thinking about the um, areas where um, uh, we're talking about a lot of disruption in terms of the environment that we've got. Uh, we've talked there a little bit about the um, need to create sustainable business, um, but also thinking about that cost base that we've got. Talking there about um, access to skills being one of those areas, big focus area that we're looking at new skills for people. And all of that actually plays into this topic of North Shoring. And, and the background to this topic and why it came up was I was actually talking to some of my colleagues in BDO and I said, I'm slightly surprised that there aren't more professional service firms that aren't considering the topic of North Shoring. And that led to the conversation with Richard, which was, uh, uh, haven't actually heard this phrase before, well, what does that represent? And this is all about, it's the first and the main reason for doing this is actually thinking about, we, we need to get our cost base to a point where we are sustainable, uh, and particularly where we are uh, incurring costs relating to things where we're not necessarily adding much value. We've also got all of our staff who, um, I, I don't know about other people's experiences, but I think they're working incredibly hard in this environment. Uh, but they're working busy, and we need to think about making sure that they're focusing on those topics where they are going to add the most value. And so this whole topic of North Shoring comes up because it kind of says, how can we actually change the way that we operate? How can we change the way that we work? And what are our options for doing this? So if you think about any uh, professional practice, what we've got is there's a, a whole slug of work we do, which we actually don't know whether it's intrinsic to what we do. Uh, it certainly keeps our people very busy and uh, they are busy doing it. Um, and it generates probably a very stable revenue base for us, but it's not necessarily the thing that's adding the most value. And it's certainly not the stuff where the client is saying, the reason I chose you as a firm is because of that stuff you do. Um, the, the reality is they probably choose you as a professional practice because of your relationships, because of your insights, because of your unique skills, because of your understanding of their issues, not because you are able to produce lots of tax returns, not because you are able to produce a set of accounts, and not because you are able to put together some standard legal documents. So if we take that slug of stuff that many practices have, and you can think about your own practices, what might represent there, that's kind of the backdrop to this to say, is there a better way of doing that uh, without it all just being stuff that keeps our, our resource really busy when we can actually get them focused on where they can add to the most value? The, the other reality is if we don't take that stuff away from some of our people, they will keep themselves busy and they won't invest their time in developing the skills which we actually are going to need in this new world. But the reality is we are in a much more uh, digital environment. We need people to be focused on those things. We are much more focused on client relationships, people willing to pick up the phone and talk to their clients, and the actual process and churn isn't where the value is. 
So the start for this is about freeing up that resource and finding a better way of doing it. It's also about driving the cost to a more attractive location. Uh, so this concept of north shoring comes up because we're, we're all aware of the traditional outsourcing models where we can actually throw the work to um, some uh, distant shore. Uh, but sometimes that either feels a little bit hard to manage because we uh, don't actually have a footprint in that location or it doesn't quite do what we want. We don't feel we quite control it. We get a standard service and standard service levels. We don't feel we actually own and control that process. Or uh, the other challenges around the perception, uh, because the reality is, do your clients value the work being done in those other locations, or would they like to feel it was still being done here in the UK? And there are actually other complications to throw into this, such as uh, data and where data can be based. Um, if you missed it, we, we left the EU. and We're just in the process of working out what that means in terms of all, all the data and uh, everything else. And therefore, we actually need to think about, uh, you know, do we actually have more of that located locally? Um, and also, the other thing that's going to happen is there's going to be quite a scary thing where I think we're all going to come out of this uh, COVID world at the same time. Uh, I suspect, because there are many brilliant practices out there, we're all going to be pushing at the same time. And we're probably there going to drive up a lot of salary inflation in the market and the ability to attract and get the right resource for our business. It's going to be hard and that will lead to salary inflation. So again, we get to this world of how can I access other skills and other talent to uh, deal with a lot of what I'm doing? And how can I actually create that sustainable business and get the right cost base? OK, so that's the concept of why this is relevant. So North Shoring, well, North Shoring is uh, literally moving elements of your work up north. Uh, why would you do that? Well, uh, on a cost basis, the actual space cost, we did this at BDO, the space cost was one nineteenth of that in London. That's one nineteenth of that in London. Um, we also, in the north of England, have a plethora of outstanding, good quality schools and universities. Uh, but we don't have quite the same level of competitiveness in terms of jobs that might exist in, say, London. So actually, if you think about the whole range of uh, top tier universities that are located across the north, when you think across the outstanding schools that are in the area, what we have is a large number of skilled people coming out of those schools and universities. We have low space cost um, and we are believe it or not, part of the UK. And therefore, things like data security and the ability to manage those people and the ability to set your firm's values on what they're doing is all absolutely in your remit. There's other benefits of this as well. So one, um, so in the case of BDO, we have uh, our offices all over the UK. But what we did was we repurposed one office. We repurposed Liverpool and basically built out that as our centre to do a lot of these functions. And they weren't all back office functions. It was tax returns. It was accounts. It was those kind of items where it didn't need someone to be sat with a client in London. It could be done in a, a centralised location. And by moving all this work into one location, it actually also created the benefits of leveraging what we did. And also then it gave us a focused place where we could think about things like uh, automation, uh, robotics, uh, simplification of processes, rationalization of processes, and all those kind of lean uh, factors. So that drove efficiency, which was one of those big topics that came up in Richard's survey. It drove efficiency through how we operate, and there's still a lot more we can do. But it's not just a process as well. It's also accessing other skills as well. So when we did this, we've now got 350 people based up in uh, Liverpool. And we actually have people that speak 32 different languages fluently because they've come in from the universities and, and have those different backgrounds. Uh, that gives us access to skills that we didn't have before. Uh, the investment in uh, focusing on digital tools means that our ability to apply robotics and AI is much quicker. And also those efficiencies helping to drive efficiency in the organization. But also, what do you do when you suddenly say, I've, I've got a piece of work coming in. Who are the people who can deliver that? Well, actually, we have the ability to access a much wider skill base uh, because of all those schools and universities. And so we can flex our resource and uh, enable us to take on work quicker at, in a cost effective way. So that's kind so of the back North Shoring. So very quickly, just the last thing I was going to say on it was, uh, you know, what are the options? Well, the options could be you set up your own SSC, but it could be you actually look for a friendly firm based up north who could actually take on some of that work for you and agree it in a way that is um, acceptable. 
to you. So maybe another professional practice firm that you're able to partner with who would actually say, let's work with you to generate those opportunities. So that was the, those are the main points I wanted to cover off, really, and just set the tone. Thanks very much, Mark. That, again, I think for a lot of people, the, work, the, the, the term North Shoring, you instantly get, but actually to understand how you're making it work in practice and pioneering yourself is fascinating. And uh, as we'll probably pick up later, the, the four of us looking to organise a summit to actually start bringing together some of these um, <coughs> London firms and regional firms to actually uh, uh, <coughs> see whether those partnerships are indeed something that can be moved forward. Anne, over to you now. Anne, if I mentioned, was is a recruiter. She says she's been doing it for 30 years, so must know a lot of people, but um, a lot of secrets as well, I suspect. And she's going to kind of talk a bit about um, how you might go about building your management team for the current context. Thank you, Richard. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk in quite broad terms of, of things that might affect that, that team, because I think we always talk about the new normal, but it, is it now the new normal or is it just normal because we're all getting so used to it? So I want to just take a little look back to the last recession to say why we've had to change and what impacted them, which will affect recruitment now. So what did we learn from 2008? Well, financial performance was the number one priority then, and it still is now, obviously. But in 08, the staff budgets were slashed and the reduction in talent was absolutely immense. And support staff, let's make no bones about it, were treated brutally and they took on the brunt of those staff cost cuts. Um, that loss of talent had a negative effect for quite a long time after the crisis passed, and there really was a war for talent. But firms that kept that hard to replace human capital weathered the crisis better, and they prospered as the economy recovered. And roles were upskilled by necessity, especially financial roles. I lost track of the number of finance directors we placed between 08 and 09, and now you cannot do without a decent finance director, that's for sure. Now, in 2020, we didn't knee-jerk and dismiss staff because we had the furlough scheme obviously in place to help that. But suddenly, non-performance became reviewed across the board, not just support staff, but with fee earners and partners. And that's the first time I'd seen that happen. And staff concerns moved to the very top of the agenda. And that mental and physical well-being and a sense of community became absolutely paramount. Now, we embraced uncertainty in a different way because we absolutely had to. And COVID shone a light on things we didn't even consider or think possible in 2008. We know, as Mark said, digital transformation has become turbocharged. And we know those IT costs became wise investments. And working from home um, whilst still being productive and working remotely became absolutely normal. And I was asked recently by a candidate, does it matter that this role is based in London? Does it matter where I live? And that's a fair point because it used to be absolutely standard for directors to have a flat in London during the week and travel quite long distances home at weekends. But does that really matter now? Because we can all work remotely. And uh, concerns for staff wellbeing have become the hallmark for best in class employers, that's for sure. It, it really does ensure that firms not only attract staff, but they retain staff. And it is very powerful when I'm recruiting to let people know how staff were treated during the lockdown and how they're being treated now when they were still working remotely. But things that we considered totally impossible just aren't. We interview remotely, we do induction remotely, we train remotely, and data security whilst working remotely is in hand. Now for me, professional services are different to other sectors in two major ways. And that's the nature of the work because it's bespoke and it's tailored to clients regardless of the service model or the data. And the cultivation of long-term client relationships is absolutely key. But these two things need skilled delivery capabilities. So actually, your people are your firm. And in recent MPF surveys, Richard, I have been paying attention, please note, and it came up again today. Three things carried the most weight with the board. And that's finance and cash flow. And it was right at the top again this week. Marketing and new business generation, which we saw today has moved up again, and client service. So whilst there is consolidation in operational activities, it is much easier to make a business case 
in those business critical areas for new roles. And whilst there is consolidation, um, you know, we can move forward in a different way. In 2008, there was very little strategy regarding talent. But in 2020, that business talent strategy is firmly tied now to the firm's operating model. And businesses are recalibrating their core strategy with today's realities in mind. And we've heard a lot today on that poll about client-driven focus. And I sat on a, a banking conference not very long ago, and I listened to a panel of general counsels expressing how frustrated they were with the lack of engagement and the assumption that law firms had got it right. So there is a time now for a more engaging, a more informative and transparent connection to clients. And I think a higher quality delivery approach would increase the share of those that do engage in this way. Now, whilst we're talking about client-centric engagement and innovation, I think that should be the absolute gold standard for recruitment, and it's sadly not often there. I act as an advisor to firms, as do many other good recruiters. I expect to sit with the board and engage with areas of the business where the role has impact. I need to gain an understanding of those firms' needs and their vision moving forward so I can explain that to candidates. And as Richard alluded to, I've had over 30 years in recruitment. And sadly, I have heard recruiters called all manner of things. But I think apropos of the time of year, yeah, we are vampires in the way that you have to invite us in to get us in there. And when you do invite us in, we will suck you dry, but for information. Because if you give us that information, it will make the procedure better for everyone. So please bear that in mind when you're recruiting roles that have a real impact on the firm. Because... <laughs> Otherwise, we just simply can't help you. There is a time for gatekeepers and there is a time to really engage with your recruitment people. Now, roles are emerging, no doubt, that have we haven't yet fully imagined, but we are starting to, thank goodness. Those directors of well-being, the director of engagement and more non-exec directors coming into the sector that we haven't seen before. And we've gone from those very brutal cuts of 2008 to really the art of the possible. And I think we're getting quite close to the art of the amazing as new innovation comes in. I think firms will be more agile, they will be lean, they'll be more digitally infused and they'll be experience centric and they might even North Shore, time will tell. Thank you. Thanks, I love the idea of uh, being the ear of the amazing. Um, Janet, come and tell us a little bit about your take from a fantastic perspective. And uh, as many people know with Janet, she was not just the uh, managing senior partner of Simmons & Simmons, but has been the Commission for Public Appointments. She kind of looked after the House of Commons for a number of years as well, and is now um, a sole trader, but enjoying herself like me at a stage in one's life when we don't have to do anything if we choose not to. Thank you, Richard. Um, good morning, everyone. I have a question, and this is the question I'm going to try and answer in the next five minutes, uh, which is, will we continue to work differently in the future? Uh, bearing in mind, we've, we're undergoing, I think, one of the biggest behavioural changes in, in our history. Uh, what will it hold? I want to look at it from four different points of view, uh, the issue of working from home. And they're the four T's, time, task, tempo, and trust. Uh, first of all, time. The interesting thing about home working is that we're working longer hours. Uh, I gather from Harvard that I think the increase, uh, this is uh, worldwide, is about 8.2% in terms of the increased workday. Um, that's about 48.5 minutes. Now, it may be that you're putting the washing in the washing machine, and that's why you've got a longer working day. But that, that, that is, is worth noting. We're, we're having more meetings, we're spending less time on them, we're sending more emails, and we're particularly sending more emails after business hours. So another example of the extended working day. It's called asynchronous work. Uh, now, that's important because we are failing to control time. Working from home doesn't help us to control time. In fact, it makes it worse. And it also emphasizes how important it is to have a regular schedule. The reason this is important is that younger generations joining the workplace do want to control time. They want to be in charge of their time. So there's a bit of a conflict there. The second thing is task. 
we must remind ourselves that not everyone can work from home. On the last, last latest figures, 60% of adults are traveling into work. We need, we need not forget the 60% who are not working from home. Um, so we mustn't always look at this through the lens of remote working. Um, so we need to ask the question, is the work that the person is doing at home suitable for working from home? Is there some way that we can change it? Do we want to atomize the job? Do we want to break it up into small tasks? Um, some people are predicting there'll be a greater reliance on contractors and temps. And do we really need to do Zoom so much? I mean, it's completely unnatural to be attentive for so many hours. Uh, so we need to look at the task again, not to assume that because the person did the job in the office, it's necessarily the right way to do it at home. Third area, tempo. This is about the pace of work. It's, again, far more difficult to control when you're working at home. We all talk about the blurring of life between working at home and working in the office, uh, between work and home life. And, and actually, I think one of the things that the pandemic has done and the whole working at home scenario, it has highlighted how disproportionately many tasks fall to women. Now, there's a big debate going on at the moment about whether working from home helps women or doesn't help women. There have been headlines that are saying that women are leaving the workplace because they, they don't like working at home. Uh, there are others saying, oh, no, it's wonderful for women because now they can try and be promoted and succeed because they can do a, a pick and mix. Uh, time will tell. Uh, and the last thing is trust. Um, it is extremely difficult to manage a remote team and to build a remote team. People work for a purpose. Predictability and repetition build trust. People need to like and believe in their colleagues. So all those virtual tea breaks, those are, those are really, really important. That's social interaction and communication. Um, the problem with this is that if you lose the trust, you erode the culture. And um, that cultural erosion takes time, uh, that culture takes many, many years. It's hard to build up. You can lose it very, very quickly uh, after a working from home scenario for a long period. So those are the four aspects that I've been particularly focusing on with working from home. What do I conclude from this? Well, it's a battleground. Working from home is a battleground between the workers' preference for flexibility and the employer's temptation to micromanage. And I think that will continue. We are still in a crisis. We have to bear in mind we are in a crisis. We're in crisis mode. And one of the most important takeaways from my point of view is that employers must empathize with remote workers' personal circumstances. They've got to over communicate. They've got to exercise what one person has called competent compassion. And what this means is that managers in their skill set, emotional intelligence, social skills are going to be really, really important going forward. I don't believe the office is dead. Uh, as I've said, we're still in crisis mode. I think it's too soon. And I know some employers are not accepting requests for continuous remote working. Some employees have put their hands up, said to their employers, oh, please, I love this. I want to carry on working from home uh, all the time. But employers are being slow to say yes. And the reason they're being slow to say yes is because they're still not sure what that future working model is going to look like. And we are still in crisis mode. And there are lots of other things. Some people don't like doing continuous remote work. It could be a productivity disaster in the long term because of the physical and mental impact on employees. Uh, some people argue, and there's an argument about this, whether face-to-face -face collaboration is necessary for innovation. Ald Andy Haldane thinks it does. It's necessary. Other people don't. Um, there was a lovely letter in the Times which said, well, Picasso didn't um, seem to have a problem working from home. So uh, that, that doesn't uh, support the argument that you have to be in the office to be creative. Um, Remote work itself leads to a more for more formal communication style. So it's often what's not said that does the damage rather than what's said. Um, and lastly, again, cultural erosion. I think that's a real worry. Uh, slowly losing 
motivation of your employees and loss of the values that an organization is is basing itself on. So the result is, yes, it will be, I think, a hybrid working world. But the question is, how hybrid? Um, And from a law firm point of view, I find this really quite exciting and fascinating because I've experienced working in a traditional law firm. I've also experienced running a virtual law firm. And I often said uh, that I thought there would be a third model between the traditional law firm and the virtual alternative legal service provider law firm. Are we seeing that emerging now? Who knows? The last thing I want to leave you with um, is a quote from John Ruskin, because in the midst of all this, talking about remote working, uh, he came up with three things that make people happy at work And I had to smile when I read them because I thought these are still true today and they are as follows. People must be fit for it. They must not do too much of it. And they must have a sense of success in it. I know that's the 19th century, but I think it applies to remote working today. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. I'm going to have to listen to that at least three times because there's so much distilled wisdom. So thank you so much. Francesca, please give us your thoughts on what you've heard so far today. Oh, well, good Lord. I mean, there were so many great presentations there. This is going to be a little bit tricky to, to, to ram into a few minutes. There was there was so much there. Um, let me start with the, the, the latter two points around that working from home and that, you know, a masterclass there uh, from Janice around how, how to view this. And um, I was lucky enough to listen to a presentation this week from Gartner. Uh, Gartner is sort of a, a global organization there. They're very good in this whole people area. And they talked about radical flexibility and they also talked about this concept of a hybrid a hybrid between this new way of working from home and then there's also this piece around that still desire for people to connect in a more physical way Um, and the radical flexibility they're wrapped up into the concept of a new deal do you actually need to be very intentional about the deal you're offering your people so it's not about let's just see how it goes but really intentional about how that moves together And and, and I think that picks up a number of those great points and so Ruskin was a smart guy wasn't he all those excellent points that were mentioned at the end because um, that elongated days uh, that um, are people getting a worse deal or a better deal by working from home huge concerns for people and as uh, I think was also alluded to really nicely by Anne was that piece around the well-being it's it's not an option it, it's a deal breaker people will look at what you do today and and when when who knows where this pandemic is going to go but they will say how was I treated when times were tough and it will really colour their view of an organisation. And I just want to pick up also on the great presentation from Mark around um, uh, the, the, the whole concept of North Shoring and take that into a global context. Um, the, the version of North Shoring can often become cross-border shoring. How can you work uh, as combined units where life has thrown a bit of a curveball at all of us and you may find that you aren't able to build what you thought you could in a particular environment, supply chains have changed, people are working differently. Can you effectively North offshore uh, across countries and the actual answer is absolutely yes you know can you have a cluster or a honeycomb of like-minded firms who are effectively doing exactly what was talked about uh, in terms of uh, the Liverpool example can you do that uh, with different countries working together maximizing their skills and I think that's the real excitement of where we're going now because can you bring the best people not just from your office not just from your collection of offices, but maybe even globally, the best people to a job. So you've got the right people doing the right job in the right way. It's hugely, hugely exciting. It kind of funny because it kind of takes you back in a way to what's often called um, Scrum and the whole notion of when you are looking at a project, and this comes from the IT world, when you're looking at a project, you should actually be bringing the best people together into a room, uh, giving them loads of pizza, locking the door, and keeping management's principal role is to keep the blockers out and those who haven't got a role to make sure that they have a role or find them a new role. 
Um, and, uh, and that's a bit simplistic, I know. Uh, Mark, what, what are your thoughts? Because obviously BDO is, again, part of a big global network. I mean, to, how do you see this sort of what I call local in them? I can use that term north, but also across a, a broader network. How, how does that work? Yeah, with you? I mean, Francesca's point's absolutely right in terms of this is a supply chain issue as well in terms of what might have worked in previous pre-COVID might not work now. It's a bit harder to travel. It's a bit harder to bring stuff together. But but absolutely, countries working together is, is the key. Brexit's messed that up a little bit from an um, EU point of view. It doesn't stop it. It just creates a new complication in there. Um, but you are seeing these clusters coming together. The, the, the question is around it's that like-minded piece because culturally not all countries are the same. If you can get countries who spark, work together – really exciting opportunity the other question would be don't just think about your firm what about other firms as well because actually uh, if i look into kind of the medical space you have all those nhs trusts coming together to create their their shared service center who's going to do that is there is there going to be a point where we someone turns around and says let's collect together some of that stuff it doesn't really matter as long as it's done efficiently and someone else can be the uh, the taskmaster of that piece so there's a few disrupting models that it'd be nice to see the challenge is will we see them or will we just revert back to where we were before because it's just needs a bit too much imagination right there's a question from arif about um essentially policy and mindfulness and other things which I'm sure Janet will have views on but but Anne I'd like to just ask you for a second I mean we've heard a lot about uh, new models and people working in different ways and w- what are the management challenges that that brings in terms of the type of team management team you need to lead that type of firm well, what are your thoughts there? Well, I'll, I'll pick up on Janet's point. It's very hard to keep culture alive and going. And when you're building that team, it is hard when you do everything absolutely remotely. How do you keep um, people up and at it, particularly when you're bringing in new members of those team who might not have actually in person met anyone else? They're kind of virtual strangers to them, if you like. Um, so I think that's the difficulty. How do you engage and constantly engage to send that message down the line is what I'd say. Janet, a um, couple of, as I said, there's a question from Arif around the extent to which you need to set in processes and procedures to support different ways of working from home. And if you've seen that one in the chat. Um, but again, do pick up that point and, and others that you think are pertinent to this conversation. Well, firstly, on, on Arif's question, a lot of employers were doing this, actually, when they worked in offices, you know, instituting policies about uh, well, trying to anyway, to bring some sort of work-life balance by telling people not to respond to emails after a certain time. The problem is we're in a we're in a client-centered business. And if the client wants something done, you do it. Um, I mean, I, I'd love to say that you put in processes and it's all going to be wonderful. But the reality is in the world we live in, uh, which is even more 24-7 now than it was before the pandemic, um, I'm afraid people will be tempted to answer that email. Um, I, I, I'm not saying don't do these things. Don't, don't, don't. You know, introduce a mindfulness um, training module or whatever. Um, but uh, the temptation will be there to deal with the client request. Uh, so I, th- I think that's an issue. The, the other point, um, and this is the point about um, hybrid firms, um, is that one of my experiences, having worked in a virtual firm situation is that one found that one had to make connection points, solid connection points throughout the year. I always said it was a bit like the church. You always had to have festivals at some stage during the year. So in this context, even though people were working from home, you always had to have points at which people came together. And I think that is is going to be really, really important going forward. Uh, Mark, I think you've also there's a risk dimension to this as well, isn't there? I think in yeah, I, to explore that. Yeah, there's a there's a concern I've got here. So when you did the survey earlier on, Richard, the lowest score for the things that were concerning businesses going forward was risk. It was about four percent, I think, when I looked at the numbers on that. 
And yet we've just gone and displaced all our workforce, disrupted all of our work processes. The, the, the biggest challenge we always have is getting junior members of staff to raise their hands and say, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't understand something. And now they're all working in their homes or working in these distributed patterns. And I don't know the extent to which we have fully addressed the risk here. And there are a lot of people prowling in the distance around cyber risk, around uh, fraud. Economic climate means that fraud is going to go on the increase because people will be worried about their income and so forth. I, I think risk is going to be a nasty little thing that's going to come back around on us. So I think it's just a, a flag that I'm worried that people have got it so low on their agenda when I actually think it's kind of like the uh, uh, the prowling monster out there that is going to come back in a few years. And it could also include occupational health. It could include kind of the well-being health and all of that. You know, did we make sure people were safe and sitting straight at their workstations? But I don't know. We couldn't get to see them, could we? Because we were locked down. So there were uh, there's a, a lot of issues there around risk that I think people have got to push up the agenda. I, I suppose just... in a way, sorry, I was going to say in a way there's an issue around uh, <clears throat> short term survival and getting the business right, looking into the future, where possibly the risk issues are a bit different. So Janet, over to you. Sorry. Can I just add one thing to that uh, that Mark has just said, and and it's something that people really don't talk about very much. Uh, is the individual employee's responsibility for their own health and safety. Uh, but how many of us have actually done a proper uh, assessment of our workstations and our chairs and whether our backs are suffering and uh, whether our electrical equipment complies with the electricity at work regulations? You know, I mean, all those things have gone completely out of the window. Um, I mean, I spent years d advising on health and safety matters and everyone said, oh, that's dreadfully boring. Um, and even at the moment with people working at home, health and safety is very rarely mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. And Richard, you mentioned it there. It was a, a need. We had to do it really quick. So I think probably in that situation, that's OK. But that was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> so we are now in a situation we are still working this way. I don't think that need is quite the same. I think we should be ensuring that we've actually assessed the controls, processes, the health and safety, the work environments and, and measure what people are OK. I must admit, I'm shifting really uncomfortably in my chair in my kitchen at the moment, going, oh, is my chair really compliant? I think it's a long way off that. I, I think there's a really great point here, isn't there, around um, the personal responsibility piece, but also the fact that if we are shifting to a new way of working, the employer needs to get more engaged around actually do people have the right things in play? And also just that broader piece, you know, do, do you start paying for people's Wi-Fi? Do you um, actually go, I don't care where you live, I just need you to have great broadband. Um, or I don't, I don't mind if you decide to move out of, say, a big urban centre, as long as uh, you do these particular things. There's a, I think it does come back to that Gartner concept of a new deal. You know, you need to have real intentional explanations of this is what we expect to provide you as an employer, and this is what you as an individual within this organisation need to bring to the party. And I, I think it does require that really specific thinking about all those different elements that everyone's been talking about today. I mean, there's another issue, which again may appear trivial, but if, as is often the case, there's a lot of what you might call corporate equipment sitting in people's homes, are you going to check that their insurance policy covers it properly? You know, how are you going to actually make sure that your your assets, because often that's been kind of distributed across the firm, uh, are actually there? Because you're not going to start, I think, checking that people lock their doors at night or don't leave the windows open, but that usually in most insurance policies is going to be a, a problem. So, you know, how far do you go? Do you start measuring keystrokes in terms of productivity? You know, there's all sorts of technology out there, but where does management draw the line? Um, and we haven't heard from you for a bit. Do you have any thoughts on uh, where this conversation is taking us? I think there will be a real stress element. And I see that when I'm talking to people, why, why are you looking to leave your job? And people are working longer and longer hours. I spoke to a finance director the other day who literally never got home. He was he was living in a hotel. He lived in London, but was going to a hotel to get sleep to then come back into the office. That's ludicrous. Um, and he was going into the office, but that's that's bonkers. Um, but he felt he was more engaged to be there from working at home, but then he never got home. Um, and then we have people at home, um, absolutely that stress to oblivion, who can't see the way forward. And I think what's really sad is they sometimes feel they are engaged with their team, 
But when you ask them, they are certainly not engaged with their team in the way that we might all think would be better. And it's quite shocking when you ask people, you know, what, what are you doing with your team? And Mark was talking when we, we met up earlier, saying some of the great things that he, he's done in, in terms of, you know, challenges and things. That he, but so many people still don't do that. They just make an assumption that the team will be OK. And that's really quite sad. Yeah, it's a bit like last week where we were talking about uh, partners and unretirement and saying all the focus is on millennials. But what about the people who are now coming to the end of their career? Are firms paying enough attention to them? Because they they may not just want to be hanging around and doing nothing. And they may be like me, wanting to be all active and doing things. Who knows? Um, Francesca, I was gonna say, let, let, we're coming to that. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, Mark, go. I was going to say very quickly, really important point there, Richard, that you just touched on. We talk a lot about the staff. Uh, but what about those who were absolutely battle fatigued from the sheer pace of decision making that has had to be made since March? And I think that is the other piece that we're not seeing as much as I would like to see. I think it's the where are we looking after the welfare of the decision makers? Because if, if they're fatigued and we're going into another, well, we are in another spike, that's going to result in bad decisions. It's going to result in people giving up or whatever. So we've got to look after those people as well. So. Yep, um, we love managing partner syndrome and all that stuff, hence the managing partners forum, I guess. Francesca, give us your final thoughts for today. Well, I, th I think that sort of takes us beautifully to a conclusion here is around um, that look, that self-care and also that uh, care for whoever's in your organisation. Um, we've talked a lot about with war imagery, haven't we? You know, battles, fights, and it feels a bit like that. I think we all feel a little bit under the cosh at the moment as many countries go into their second lockdown or third lockdown in some cases. But I think there's a piece here around um, we can take control of how we deal with our own people and also what we bring to the party. So I think there's a huge amount amount of, of comfort to take out of the fact that if you look at what we've been doing in the last few months, it's, we would never, ever have believed it would have been possible. So uh, we need to take some of that positivity uh, through the winter for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere uh, in the hope that uh, 2021 will bring um, or will take all this good, the good from the last few months into the future, as well as learn from the mistakes. Fantastic. Well, I'm afraid now it, it, it is the, the day, the time of the day when one has to uh, actually say goodbye to our wonderful panel. So I'd like to thank uh, Francesca, obviously. I'd like to thank Anne for her insights around, particularly one around stress. And the poor guy won't have a home, I suspect, if he lives in a hotel. Uh, Janet, who's given us, I think, a masterclass and a whole range, a whole bunch of issues around her four T's. And lastly, obviously, Mark, who's going to be continuing to stir the, stir the pot and make sure that actually people really Really do make sure that things are approached in a sensible way and I think your point at the end around let's make sure decision makers are in the right place is really really fundamental. So I'd like to thank the panel. Uh, for those of you who uh, haven't got a chance to catch up we have all the poll findings and of course obviously the actual episodes appear in the management library and as of, well, we're now we're well by there. We're putting all the five minute talks into YouTube and I'll be dropping you a note about that shortly so that you will actually be able to catch up with over 60, I think it is now, probably 70, including today, really lovely snappy insights into aspects of how you might retune your firm. So all it really remains to say from me is I hope you found today valuable and please encourage your peers to join us for future episodes. We're number 30 today. I don't know when it's gonna end, but as long as when I've got amazing panels like today, I think you'd go on forever. Bye for now.